Well, good evening. Good to see you back this evening. I trust you had a refreshing break. Let me once again give honor to whom honor is due. Uh, Dr. Michael Dudway, uh, your dean here, and the uh, founding publisher of Preaching, the president of the Evangelical Homiletic Society. Uh, very few persons have had the impact on preaching in America in such a wide spectrum way as Dr. Didway has over the last number of decades. And thank you for letting me come uh, to be here with you uh, and just share this time of Broadus Lectures. Uh, what a name. They're eponymous lectures named for John A. Broadus. Many of you may know that for 75 years, at least, his textbook was the textbook on preaching not just for Baptists, but for Protestants in America. It's a long shadow cast by Dr. John Broadus. And just a footnote, his commentary in the old American commentary is to this day one of the best commentaries on Matthew's gospel. I've treasured that for decades. Uh, what a name, what a prolonged Influence. Also pleased to see friends. I didn't want to let the cat out of the bag, but I'm so pleased that uh, Dr. Dante Wright is going to be joining with the faculty here. Uh, he went to a superannuated church in Round Rock, Texas, which is really North Austin. Moved from there, filled up a, a, a gold gym, golden gym, filled that up, and built an entire new church plant. Uh, and uh, you're going to be blessed by his ministry uh, with you here. God bless you, uh, my good friend. We're going to begin again this evening uh, where we were. We looked a bit at the theology behind the practice of sermon lived experience. We talked about some of the reasons for it, not all of them, but some of the reasons and then qualities of effective lived experience in sermons. Now, there's a diagram in the book by Dr. Brian Chappell, which I, perfectly catches uh, the ideal of lived experience. If you're familiar with that book, it has three sets of parentheses, and he says exposition in the top set ought to rain down, R A I N, into illustration. That ought to rain down into application. That is to say, the right sermon story is not something gratuitous. It's not an unrelated additive to the sermon. It negotiates itself into exposition, throwing light on it, and it paves the way for application. I, I like Dr. Chappell's image of one raining down into the other. I sometimes use the metaphor of a mixing bowl, and that is, it's as if they're poured into the same bowl, and there is a mixture in which one negotiates itself into the other. I'd like to begin with what I ended with, exposition ought always to dominate your sermon. That is, explanation of the word of God is not subordinate to anything in the sermon. The story is a supporting actor. <laughs> the application, that is oughtness, comes out of the isness of the exposition. And you need to give them the isness before the oughtness, the theology before the ethics. But that leads me to talk about one more quality of a good lived experience in sermons. And that is, it is a street light and not a Tiffany lamp. <laughs> now, if you're made of Tiffany lamps, the glass works of Charles Tiffany in, in New York City and now the jewelry store, Tiffany lamps at the turn of the last century were beautiful cut glass lamps. They looked like a stained glass window transformed into a lamp. A genuine Tiffany lamp now costs tens of thousands of dollars. I don't have one. 
but you don't buy them to read by. They're not used for the purpose of a lamp. They're at a place of honor in a home, and people come and say, oh, a Tiffany lamp. Street lights very different. I do a lot of nighttime walking, thinking, ruminating, chewing the cud. Never one time did I ever look up and say, oh, what a street light. <laughs> street lights function is not to call attention to themselves, but to light the way for where you're going. Sermon stories need to be street lights more than Tiffany lamps. That is, they show the way you're going in the exposition. If they take a Tiffany lamp quality, they've outsized what a sermon story ought to be. Now, the implication of that is some things as stories are just too hot to handle. <laughs> they shine too brightly. They drowned the sermon. They overwhelm the text. Let me give you an example of a life experience of mine that I don't tell in sermons anymore. It's an example of something that ran away with the sermon. It was a November morning. I was a sophomore at Arlington Heights High School in West Fort Worth, Texas, when I borrowed my father's ancient Oldsmobile and drove downtown and parked it close to the Texas Hotel in the dark mist of that November morning. I'd read that the President of the United States might come out of that hotel where he and the First Lady were spending the night. And I got right up next to a police barricade and waited two hours in the frozen mist. Sure enough, John F. Kennedy walked out of the front door of the Texas Hotel, flanked by Lyndon Johnson and John Conley walked right straight to where I was standing. I held my hand out, looked into his blue eyes, saw his ruddy face, red hair, shook his hand. Right after that, shook the hand of Lyndon Johnson. Right after that, with Governor John Conley. I was in fifth period biology at 1.15 that afternoon when they put the Anchor man Walter Cronkite, right directly on the high school speaker system with no explanation. I was watching a flask in chemistry, and he, he was weeping, and he said the president had been assassinated. Remember this day, I looked at my hand, shaking the hand of two presidents that day. Now, that's an experience for a lifetime, but it ruins a sermon. <laughs> it ruins a sermon. It's over. I've tried to use that at the beginning of a sermon, end of a sermon, middle of a sermon, trying to find a text to go with that. The problem is it, it drowns the sermon. Almost all of us have had some peak experiences that are so laden with pesos, so fraught with emotion, that it floods the congregation. I use that as an example because I don't tell that in a sermon. I might tell it at a dinner party or something, or if the assassination comes up. It's too much, too hot to handle. It becomes a Tiffany lamp rather than a street light. So there's some things that happen you just have to park over here and say this overwhelms or floods a sermon. Now, you have to have a sense of aesthetics, a sensitivity to the venue, to say when does that happen, and you've overwhelmed the exposition with a lived experience. I just want to point that out. Some of them just need to be parked and kept for dinner <laughs> conversation, or they run away with the sermon. Now, the next quality I would call pertinent. And that is, sometimes I use the word organic. The story grows out of a word or a concept in your text. And that is perspicuous. That means it's clear to the congregation. A gratuitous story is stopping to tell a story just because you're losing the people and it's time to tell the story. Now, often a, a joke is used for that way that has absolutely no relationship 
to where you are in the sermon. Parenthetically, a word about humor. Humor works if it's on point for that movement of that sermon. It is a deflection and demeans and belittles and diminishes the preaching moment if it's simply telling a joke to tell a joke. Uh, Spurgeon used a good deal of humor. Uh, Spurgeon, if you've read his biography, the first years of his ministry in London, uh, everybody was against him. Uh, the old Baptists were against him. The state church was against him. He was just sui generis. And you can understand that. Here was a 19-year-old self-taught who in two weeks had more people listening to him preach than the Oxford and Cambridge gradu graduates in London. And they, one of the complaints was he used too much humor. And his answer was, if you only knew how much I hold back. <laughs> <laughs> but he used it deftly. He used it adroitly. He used it in a way that <clears throat> that supported what he was saying in the sermon. Now, the right use of humor uh, can help something stick in a sermon. I was uh, in the Atlanta airport, one of those big concourses where everybody is getting somewhere. A lady walked up and got right in my face, pointed her finger at me, and said, coconut. What? <laughs> Except there are thousands of people. I had no idea. She said, you're the man who told about the coconut. And then it came to me that back when I used to preach on TV, I'd preached a sermon from James 3.1 where James, the younger half-brother of Jesus, says, we all stumble in many ways. I'd just come back from preaching at the Hawaii Baptist Academy, and they had given me coconuts. But they weren't uh, coconuts that had the husk removed. These coconuts still had the husk. Now, I don't know how it is in South Carolina, but we don't know anything about that in Texas. <laughs> and uh, got it home. My younger sons then said, Dad, can we get in this? I said, sure, boys. So, I said, and I had to wonder, I said, and I, said I, I was kind of making this up as I went with them. I said, and typically to get into this, they'll, they'll saw their way through this. Well, I got a, a, a metal saw. It got all caught in the fiber. Didn't do a thing. Two little boys looking at me. I said, well, really, when, when they're in a hurry to get into it, they'll take a drill and drill through it. Well, I found out that doesn't work well either. The fiber just gets around the drill. Uh, well, making it up as I went, I said, actually, in the big coconut factories, they put pressure on them and cracked them, and I wedged it under the front left tire of my car. <laughs> and I found out something about projectiles. <laughs> I tried to run over it. It, <laughs> it went through a glass French door into our entryway, <laughs> broke the glass, and I still hadn't gotten into the coconut. <laughs> we all stumbled in many ways. Now I learned several things from that lady that came up to me and said coconut and that was how a humorous story can stick. And it didn't take too long talking with her to get that connected to what I was trying to illustrate. On topic humor works. The thing to avoid is gratuitous humor. That is humor just to be telling a story in the middle of the sermon. It splits the move, and it takes the congregation out of the story. And we're all tempted to do that. But <laughs> don't let that temptation overwhelm you and override the worthiness of the exposition uh, with a story. Now, next thing I'd like to say is, first of all, make sure they're fresh. We're going to talk about finding stories in a little bit, but there is no reason to use a shop-worn, hackneyed, overused, predictable illustration. I heard some growing up in Texas, if the preacher had fallen over, everybody in church could have finished the story. They'd heard it so often. You have tools now to find topical stories that no preachers in the history of preaching had in terms of searching for topical stories. There is no use to use overused, ambiguous, trite, 
hackneyed, shop-worn, predictable stories anymore. You can find fresh, engaging, detailed stories that really do illuminate what you're talking about in your sermon. Now, having said that, let's sh shift over. And I would call this uh, a collection <laughs> of sources for sermon stories. <laughs> People say, well, where do you find stories? And let me use Spurgeon's metaphor in his unforgettable book, Lectures to My Students. If you've never read that book, to this day, it's a classic. The great man would go out to Spurgeon's College on Friday lecture to his students, and those were put in a volume. He has a couple of chapters in their own illustrations. And as he was able to do, he had a very apt metaphor for it. He called it windows for your house. I like to build on that and say sometimes you have a house without windows, and sometimes you reach into a storehouse of windows and put them in the house you're working on. First of all, I'd like to talk about being a window collector. <laughs> and that is collecting stories without knowing where they'll go. To me, that is the best way to get stories. You find them naturally in your reading, in your observation. You collect them not knowing where they will go. They ripen, they mature, they become thicker, more robust. That's the best way to find them. Now you find them in that way through reading and observation. Uh, let me talk a little bit about a reading program and resources. First of all, no preacher has the amount of time to read enough <laughs> to find enough stories to use. But let me give you a couple of good sources that are a shortcut, if I could. One is the New York Times Sunday Book Review in the huge thing that is the New York Times Sunday edition. Every week, there is an insert that's the New York Times book review. That gives you the best in fiction and nonfiction in very well-written, long reviews of the best of literature, fiction and nonfiction. In those reviews, you can find illustrative material. They're so long and full. The other two goes by a similar name, the New York Review of Books, altogether unrelated. It's a tabloid size. Libraries take it. I subscribe to it. The New York Review of Books is even more so. Longer reviews. It's next best thing to reading the book. I never read either one of those without finding illustrative material from current literature. And if I like the book, I send off and get the book uh, because I read the review. That's a source for finding fiction and nonfiction reading because no preacher who does serious exegesis has the time to read enough books to find enough windows for the house. The very best kind of book you can read, however, for obvious reasons is biography or autobiography. Biography takes two Greek words, writing about life. It's a go-to resource. Now, biographies of any kind. We tend to think I need to be reading Christian biographies. Indeed, we do, edifying Christian biographies. But at the same time, so-called, quote, secular biographies are ripe if they're well written on virtually every page with illustrative material. Now, I always, when I talk about this, I like to kind of do a potpourri, a stew of some stuff I have more recently read just to, just to talk about that. For example... The Patriarch, a biography of Joseph P. Kennedy, the father of the president and RFK, Ted Kennedy and the others. It's a remarkable biography, the story of his life in Boston, his scramble to get rich man, absolutely filled with illustrative material about family dynamics for sermons. Memorable scene in there, all the Kennedys are on their porch at Hyannisport. Two Catholic priests walk up the long drive. That wasn't unusual. They were Catholics and priests were often there. These men look solemn. On the porch with all the family there, they brought the news that Joe Kennedy Jr. had died in a suicide mission 
He was in a plane, crew of 10, supposed to dive it toward a German rocket installation, but he didn't dive out. They gave him the word on the front porch. Biographer gives the reaction of three different sets of people. Joseph P. went up to his room, shut the door, and was never the same. Rose Kennedy, his wife, immediately went to the parish church to pray. JFK told RFK and Ted, let's go sailing. Let's go sailing. Joe would want us to go sailing. You read that. If you don't see illustrative possibilities in that, you may need to turn your license in. <laughs> Reactions to grief. I still haven't used it, but I want to use it perhaps in Jesus, Mary, Martha, at the tomb of Lazarus, reactions to grief, escapism, let's go sail, depression, going to a church. So I note out in the margin of that, and I'd urge you in reading to practice this. In the margin, write the aspect of human life that it speaks to in any biography. Grief, reaction, Two, nearly every page of that, there's some story. It has to be saved because you can't illustrate every sermon you have from Joseph P. Kennedy. Save them. Let them ripen. Very different kind of book. Uh, when Pride Still Mattered. Biography of Vince Lombardi. Great Packer coach. It's a sports biography. Every page. Just fraught with illustrative material. Work ethic, his father was an Italian butcher in Queens. He'd put his sons, Vince and others, in the meat locker till they nearly froze, working 12, 15 hours, work ethic. Went to Fordham, he was taught by Jesuits. He was a lineman at Fordham, a defensive lineman. Discipline. When he was assistant coach at Army, he took the Army game films to the Waldorf Astoria and showed them to retired General Douglas MacArthur, who commenting on the game films, commented about life and strategy, discipline, work ethic, mentor. That's why when he was a coach of the Green Bay Packers smoking five packs of Salem's a day, I mean, you all remember those guys lit one off the other. <laughs> he walked into his office, crumpled up a half-used pack, threw it in the wastebasket, and said, I'm through with it, and never touched another one. If you know anything about smokers from the time they're teenagers, <laughs> that was an act of rock-ribbed discipline. Now, if I need to find an illustration of discipline, there's one right there, influence of father, rife with it, all right? Now, that's not a, quote, Christian biography per se. He was a devout Catholic. He was a daily communicant in the Catholic Church, went to Mass every morning. But it's a story about shaping discipline. Let me challenge you in your reading. Don't waste a page of anything. If it's a story of a person's life, abstract from that what aspect of life it touches. It's difficult to read a page, read a page of a good biography without being able to conceptualize, to abstract marriage, fatherhood, motherhood, childhood, mentors, grief, depression. It, it's all there in every life. And the best way to find stories is in a larger context where you've read them and they're contextualized rather than taking them half-grown from somewhere else. Somebody mentioned today, I, and, and some of it's just random reading I do that looks outlandish when I pick the book up. I used to watch the television chef, Julia Childs. Anybody remember her? A lady, a tall lady, had a real shrill voice like this. You know, I'm going to introduce you to the chicken family today. Sir. Very unlikely television star. Many things about her are unusual. She had absolutely no, no personal faith. It, it hurt me to read that. I read this book about a year ago. 
She had no personal faith. She was a secularist. Her husband, Paul, was a secularist. This was a lady beloved all over this planet. Charming, winsome, no faith. That has a way of catching up with you. She and Paul didn't have any children. When he died, all she could do was write friends and say, Paul just slipped off the raft. What a nothing to say. Paul just slipped off the raft as if life were to be adrift in a sea. And when you go, you... And then when she got a terminal illness, literally like Hezekiah, she turned her face to the wall. And she told her friends, I'm about to slip off the raft. It was very moving to me a lady beloved by millions of people. I'd always hoped she was a person of faith, but at the end she said, I'm about to slip off the raft. How different is that from saying with Paul, if this earthly tent is dissolved, I have a building not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. I'm not going to slip off any raft. It makes me want to preach. Right here. I, I'm not... I'm not going to slip off a raft. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Another thing in that bar, let me show you what you find. World famous from the time she was a little girl, she never had the blessing of her father. She was always indicted, always fell short, never pleased him. And that drove her when she was world famous. He still would not bless her. He'd critique her television shows and critique her books, basically tell her she was wasting her time. Ah, uh, we need the blessing, folks in our family. And that's a totally secular biography about a very, what I'm trying to illustrate by doing that is saying this, anything you read has got the potential to be the grist for your mill as an illustrator. Are you following me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Matt Chandler says, are you tracking with me? <laughs> Now, that is finding windows in biographies. But let me, I do a little thing sometimes just to illustrate this, the ABCs of illustration. Just the breadth of things we can pay attention to. Say A, astronomy. There's a lot in the Bible about the cosmos. God created heavens and the earth. The heaven is higher than earth. So, so it's got all kinds of stuff about astronomy. Anytime you run into something about the cosmos, cosmology, the universe, you can bet you it can show up in a sermon. <laughs> I was preaching several years ago at the First Baptist Church in Raleigh. I was doing a Bible study for several days, and they sent me to eat with a Duke University astronomer. And to tell you the truth, I was, I was intimidated. A Duke astronomer, I didn't know what I was going to talk about. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. I didn't know what I was going to say. We were eating a, a, a pulled pork sandwich, I remember. And I was trying to think of something to ask him. I said, well, how big do you think the universe is? He shot right back, 14 billion light years. You could tell I was just looking at him. And he said, if you could harness a beam of light and ride it at 185,000 miles a second, it'd take 14 billion years to get to the edge of what we know is there. Now, I got thinking about that. My car has 150,000 miles on it. The earth is 25,000 miles around the circumference. It's, it's just like a subatomic particle in something that big. And yet, and yet, God is not impressed with the size of what he can make. He can do that on Saturday afternoon with a word, let it be. What he's impressed with is women and men created in his image who were born again and praise him and respond to him. 14 billion light years can't praise him, but a redeemed person can. Astronomy, ABCs, B, biology, all of the biosciences are apt for illustration because they're dealing with things that are alive, you know. Say you're preaching from the body of Christ passages, uh, head and body, Corinthians or Colossians. 
consider the process of osmosis. Osmosis takes place when one cell is next to another and one cell has too much water and another too much mineral. Those membranes are permeable and at the cellular level, at the cellular level, there's a drive toward equilibrium so that one supplies the other. These beautiful trees, how do nutrients get from the roots in the ground to the top of the trees? By that kind of care, one cell for the other. All kinds of things in the biosciences that touch on it. C, ABCs of illustration, chemistry. Most of us had some. If you don't know anything else about it, you know NaCl.